Okay, thank you everybody for coming to my uh, session on uh, Dynamics Con today, which is all about um, the new SQL endpoint in Dynamics. So this uh, data access and reporting with the new SQL endpoint. Uh, I'm Mark Harrington from Data8. I'm the uh, chief technologist there, so I dig into all sorts of new technology. Um, and this one really caught my eye from announcement in the MBAS summit uh, back in March. Uh, and this sort of really got me going, wanted to really sort of dig into everything that I could find out about it. Um, I'm hoping that to share that with you today. So the agenda, what we're going to look at over the next 30 minutes, is going to be all about um, how this, uh, this endpoint really fits into the, the data landscape of Dynamics, uh, how it looks to use it, a few different ways we can use it, we're going to build out a Power BI report really quickly talk about some of the capabilities that it offers over and above some, uh, some alternative data access methods. So to really get a handle on what um, this SQL endpoint is all about, I want to dig into a little bit of history um, of how data has really evolved through the ages of dynamics. So if we go back to the on-premise days, are people still on-premise be quite familiar with this, um, a user access the, uh, the dynamic system and the dynamic system will access the SQL database behind the scenes to go and get all this data. Um, a user can also run a report, which will be hosted in SSRS. And depending on what type of report you've got, whether it's a, a SQL-based report or a, a fetch XML-based report, that will either talk directly to the database itself or via the Dynamics endpoint to execute that fetch XML. And now if you're really lucky as a user, if you're um, unlucky as a sysadmin maybe, you can also give your users direct access to that SQL database. Now, whether that's for the direct access for the user or via SSRS, they will be accessing what's called these filtered views, which applies all the right security on your data. So they're not accessing really anything that they shouldn't be. Um, and so that gives exactly the same security roles as if they were accessing it through the application. So that's on premise, that's for a lot of people now ancient history. Um, if you fast forward to the online, version of CRM. Um, basically the first thing that happened when you moved to online is you just lost that SQL access. So you couldn't access it directly as a user anymore. You couldn't access it through reports. All your reports had to be fetch XML. Um, and that was the, uh, the standard for a while until uh, last year, 2019. Um, this thing came along which was um, sort of split out the, the different data storage mechanisms. So for online, instead of just having a SQL database, you now had um, blob storage and Cosmos DB storage for different data types. So most of your data was still in SQL database, things like attachments, um, audit logs, things like that, sort of very specialized data storage could be stored more cheaply elsewhere. And you'll see that today if you want to go and buy more storage capacity, you get these three different options of database uh, file or log storage. So, and now that's been the standard for another year or so. So if we move forward to today, we've got this new preview uh, TDS endpoint, sometimes called the SQL endpoint, um, sometimes called the T-SQL endpoint, all the same thing. And that puts something that looks awfully like a SQL database back out in front here. So your users can access that, and that will send on your SQL query on Dynamics to be executed. Now, what that means is that any tool that your user wants to use that can talk to a SQL database like Power BI, like SQL Management Studio, can talk to that endpoint and it can then execute those queries against your um, CDS online instance. So as far as the user is concerned, they've now got direct SQL access. As you see, it's not really direct SQL access anymore. It is going via um, the Dynamics system. So. What do we really need to know about it? The key points, the, the differences to what it was before, it does give you a way to read your database data. The key there being read. You can't write to it, you can't delete it, you can't do updates. And it's only for the database data. It's not for the data that's now stored in file storage. It's not for the data that's stored in log storage. It's not direct SQL access, although it tries quite hard to look like it. Um, it is a, a filtered version uh, of SQL Server, and that has a few impacts we're going to see later on. So I got quite excited about this. Quite a few people got excited about this, but what's the big deal? So 
the main thing is it gives us query capabilities way beyond what you can do with, with Fact XML. Um, if you're querying your data in Dynamics today, you will ultimately be using Fetch XML. You may be using tools like Fetch XML Builder to, to build up your queries, just advanced find. There's an option there to go and download the Fetch XML that, that builds. Um, it's got quite a lot of, of good capabilities in there, but it's nowhere near as flexible as SQL can be. Um, and this really extends out um, this, the query you can run to virtually the entire SQL language. Compared to some other options that give you uh, SQL access, um, by taking a, an extract, a, a live, almost live copy um, of your CDS data. It is a truly live view of your data. It is querying the actual uh, CDS SQL database behind the scenes. So as soon as a change is made by a user, it's instantly visible here. You're not waiting for uh, refresh periods, anything like that. And you also get the full uh, Dynamics security model applied as well. So everything you're used to through security roles, through teams, field level security, everything gets applied to your uh, SQL access in exactly the same way as it would do through Fetch XML or just using the application. And also because it's exposing the data as if it was a SQL server, you get integration with any tool that can talk to a SQL server. So we're gonna look at SQL Server Management Studio and Power BI today but any tool that can run against a, a SQL server can run against this thinking it is a SQL server. So there's enough talking. I wanna see a demo. I wanna see how we go and connect to this um, initially through SQL Server Management Studio and run a, few, run a few queries. So this is my demo system. It's got some accounts in here, not an awful lot else, just for a quick demo. The first thing I've got to do before I can connect to it uh, through SQL Management Studio is I've got to go and enable this new feature. It is a preview and it's off by default, so we've got to go and enable it. So if you go over to the Power Platform Admin Center, admin.powerplatform.microsoft.com, go and select your environment. If you go up to the top here, you go get up to settings, and then under product, we can go to features. And then down in the bottom right here, we've got this new TDS endpoint preview. I've turned it on here. So that's ready to go. The next bit of information we need is the URL of the instance here. So I'm just gonna copy that out. Finally, we can load up SQL Management Studio. We can connect to the server here, just paste that in. So the bits of information we need are the URL of our CRM instance is exactly the same URL as if you were connecting to the normal UI. And I'm gonna do comma 5558. So that's the magic port number that the SQL endpoint runs on. And finally, you've got to choose how you're going to authenticate to it. So you can't use, if you're used to the SQL Server, you might be used to using one of these options, Windows Authentication or SQL Authentication. You can't use either of those. You've got to use one of the Azure Active Directory options. So my account's protected with multi-factor authentication, so I'm gonna choose this one here. And I'm gonna to connect to that. So you get the standard sort of uh, authentication pop-ups you're probably used to seeing on all sorts of applications. Log into this and it's gonna appear over here just as if it's any other regular SQL server. So under here, I'll see a single database. Notice it's read-only. Mentioned that you can't do inserts, updates, that deletes, anything like that. I can just read this database. Now, if I go and have a look in here, have a little poke around, have a look in the tables. So every entity that's in your, uh, in your CDS database appears as a table in here. And we can go and write some queries against it. So I'm just gonna open up some that I've written earlier. So really simple option. I was gonna go and get some data out of my accounts. So we can go and select some standard data. And you see it's pulled back 21,000 rows here. So it's pulled back quite a lot of data there. Much more than you'd be able to get from a standard fetch XML query, which would normally top out at 5,000. And then you'd have to go and ask for the next page and the next page and the next page. I'm running a SQL query, it doesn't understand about any of that. It'll just run the query that I've given it, which pulls back all 21,000. Now these are just sort of standard uh, string fields here. Um, some of the other, uh, uh, data types have some little other oddities with it. So, 
for example, industry codes. So industry code is an option set, but it gives me two options. So I can decide to pull back either the underlying value of it or the associated name. Um, you can pull back either, both. Um, the name will intelligently pick the, the translation based on the user that's logging in. So if you, you are logging in with a French user, they'll see the French translation. Logging in with an English user, they'll see the English name. So exactly what they would be used to seeing within the user interface. Similarly with lookup values, so relationships to other entities. So as well as the, the actual ID, so I can go and get that, it gives me the, uh, the GUID of the account that the contact's part of, but there's also uh, the one with the, uh, the name suffix, it gives me the name of the account. And for some lookup fields that can refer to different types, so parent customer ID can refer to an account or a contact, it also gives you the type code, so one being account, two being contact. Things like uh, the regarding field on activities could have an awful lot of different uh, record types that they can be related to. So you need to use that type to figure out what, uh, what type of record it is being linked to. Date values are an interesting one. So dates, most dates in Dynamics are time zone specific. So I'm in the UK. Uh, we're in British summertime at the moment. As you can tell from the rain hammering down outside the window. Um, when I pull back the created on field, for example, this is in my time zone. But really times are all stored in Dynamics in the UTC time zone, which for me are all one hour behind. You can see the difference there. Now, for a user, you probably want to see your data in your own time zone normally. But one important thing to be aware of here is that all the conversion to your own time zone is being having to be done at runtime. As you run the query, it's got to figure out, this is the date that's actually stored, the user that's running it is in the UK, it needs to be translated to that time zone, so this is what it is. Which is fine when I've got three records like this. If I run this on a data set of 50,000 records and I'm ordering by the created on field, it's got to evaluate that an awful lot of times and you can actually end up with timeout error messages coming through. Um, so beware of that. Use the UTC version where you can do uh, to get that performance boost. So, so far that's all kind of stuff that you can do in Fetch XML. This one, you can't do this in Fetch XML. So this is uh, trying to get all the accounts that were created in June. Um, so you can do something similar to that probably with the right uh, on or after things, but you can't just say get the month part um, of, the, of the date and filter on that. So that's quite useful and I think that's gonna come in very handily. You notice there that took seven seconds to run. That's because I've used created on. If I change that to created on UTC and run again, that ran in less than one second. So massive performance boost. If you can use those UTC times, uh, do so. So we can select from one a table. I've been doing a count so far. Um, we can have a look at joining multiple tables together. So joining accounts to contacts, get the name of the account, get the name of the contacts inside it. Um, you see I've got three there. You can join the same table to itself. Couple of times, so this is quite a handy thing to go and find duplicates. So if I have a look at contacts with the same names as each other, so I've got, uh, according to this, two Mark Carringtons, two Mark, other spelling Carringtons, two tests. Um, but then I can actually start adding on extra filters. So again, I can do this part. I can do this part in Fetch XML. I can get contacts within accounts. I can't do this part, so I can do that part. Um, I can't do this part, which is then going to tell me that actually these two are the same record because I can filter on extra uh, fields as well. So although I've got uh, two Mark Carringtons here, one for my contact one, one for my contact two, actually they're the same ID, so there's, they're not really duplicates at all. So that's starting to do something that I can't do in Fetch XML. So 
One, uh, one very useful part I think this is going to be used for is um, having a look at your data more holistically rather than just looking at pages of individual records. I'm going to start grouping that together. So um, how many accounts do I have possibly with duplicated names? So I can again do this in part in FetchXML. Um, I can get the, uh, the accounts grouped by name, see how many of them there are. Uh, sorry, I'm guessing the number of contacts within each account. See how many contacts each account has got. It can't do more advanced aggregates in FetchXML. I can do that here. It's got, got basically the full power of SQL Server behind it here. I don't want to just know the numbers of contacts. Um, I want to know their names. So I can do that and I get back in one query, uh, one column with a comma separated list of all the names of the contacts in the accounts. This is one thing that I would have loved to be able to do in Fetch XML. You just can't do it. Um, you can do that having clause. So this is not only showing me um, the number of times each account name occurs. See, I've got an awful lot of unique account names in there. I'm only interested possibly in the ones that are duplicated. So I can use the having clause to filter that down. So imagine in Fetch XML, I'd have got all these results back um, there's thousands and thousands of them in here and I'd have had to just page through all those. With SQL I can just filter that down and just get straight to the one that I'm interested in. So much more useful. And then I can do uh, subqueries as well which is another thing we just can't do in Fetch XML. So this is um, finding me one account, one contact name per account. So for each account get me the first name by whatever um, parameter I want to put on that. Again, that's got quite a few thousands of uh, accounts in there, so that's going to take a little time to run. So you can see there it's picked out one of the Mark Harrington's for data eight, and it's left all these other ones blank. Um, if you want to get individual bits of that contact information out, you can do that more efficiently, you can do an outer apply. So again, just starting to apply all this power that you got at your fingertips uh, in SQL Server to really get a lot more um, options on how you work with the data. So this is getting me the first and last names of the most recently created contact in each account. And then we can start getting a lot more advanced again. So moving on to SQL window functions, if you um, ever, ever used those before. So this is um, going to give me an example here, just giving me a, a row number for each account or we could have a look within each industry, give me a running total of the revenue within that industry by account. Um, let me put on a, a where clause on here. Let me have a look at the ones with an industry. Put that in the right place. So you can see here within the accounting industry, um, I've got one with a 17 million pound revenue, one with a 2 million pound revenue, one with a 5 million, one with a 10 million. And then over here, I've got a running total, 17 million, 19, 24, 25 million. And then it resets when we get onto the next industry. So this would be very helpful for um, summary reporting type scenarios. Okay, so that is how we can enable connect to and then run queries against uh, the new endpoint. Okay, so now we can run um, queries there within SQL Management Studio. The reason this endpoint really exists is to be able to run Power BI reports. Now you can run Power BI reports against Dynamics already today, um, but it can be a little bit clunky. Um, and personally, we've never deployed it in that model before um, for the main reason that the data is um, it's not the live data that people come to expect. If you open up a dashboard in CRM, it's always showing you all those charts, and everything based on the absolute live data. Also data security is very important. Um, and with that uh, previous model where Power BI would basically just take an extract on that uh, refresh schedule, maybe once a day, maybe eight times a day, but the entire copy of that data is then available in the report and you can't really apply the same sort of um, security model 
that you're used to within Dynamics within Power BI. With this new endpoint, what it means is that it exposes what's called uh, this direct query model, where Power BI, instead of having a copy of the data and it doing all the number crunching for it, it passes that query on to the underlying data source and says, this is what I want to know. Come back and tell me the results. And because that's executing against this endpoint, we get all the same benefits we saw before, which is the data is absolutely live and up to date. And it's executing within the context of the person making the query, which ultimately is the context of the person looking at the report. So if a salesperson is looking at a report, they will see the data that they're allowed to see. And if you limit that to um, the accounts or the invoices that's owned by them, then they only get to see their part of the business, whereas the CEO gets to see everything and they can see the whole company picture. So this is the reason the endpoint really exists. So let's see a demo of how we can um, build a Power BI report. Uh, we're going to connect into uh, the new endpoint through Power BI. We're going to build a really simple report. I'm going to publish that out to Power BI and then see how that pulls in those live data changes and applies all the right security that we're hoping to see as well. So place to start with building a Power BI report um, is in the make portal, make.powerapps.com. Over on the left-hand side, you should see under the data option, we've got entities. Then up at the top, we've got analyze in Power BI. If you click on that, that's going to download a Power BI data source um, file. And click on that, that's going to open up Power BI desktop. Uh, and it's going to, once it connects through, it's going to ask us which bits of data we want to pull in. Um, very similar to the uh, SQL Server Management Studio view. Um, now, it is going to take a little while to do that. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead to one that I made earlier. So all I've done at this stage is I've just gone through this little wizard. It's in the other window here, um, which is just connecting. Now, I want to just show a really simple visualization of the number of accounts by industry code. I'm going to put on a, a chart visualization here. Now over on the side here, I've got all those fields that it's pulled through from the account entity. Um, and there's a lot there, so it's going to use a search option at the top to go and find the industry code field. Now, if you remember earlier when we were looking at this in SQL uh, Management Studio, you get the option of having the number version of the option set fields or the name version. So I'm going to use the name version here. And then for each industry code, I want the number of accounts. So I'm just going to put in the account ID into the value. And that should show me a quick preview here. I've got a few thousand blanks um, and I've got a small number of accounting and a small number of financial accounts. So that's it. That's pulled through all the data that we need. So I'm just going to publish this to the Dynamics Con workspace. Okay, so open up that report. Okay, and you can see that I've got now uh, four accounts in the accounting industry and four in the financial industry. So let's go and see the live data changes in action here. So I go back and create a new account here. I'm going to create a new um, demo account. And let's pick a, a third industry. So let's pick a consulting industry. I save that and come across to here and refresh this report again. So straight away, I should see this extra industry type in there. So as soon as that data change is made in Dynamics, it reflects immediately in Power BI. So there's no waiting for scheduled refreshes or anything like that. So that's the live changes. The other big part of this. Um, uh, this endpoint on Power BI is the per user security. I'm logged in here as a system administrator. I can see all the accounts. But I'm also logged in another window um, as a different user. I'm logged in as my uh, separate Office 365 account. If I go and have a look in the application to start off with, I should be able to only see the accounts that are assigned to me, which is these three accounts here. I shouldn't be allowed to see anything else. So if I go and see all accounts, I should still only see those three. So if I go and view that same report under this account, it's just got a cache there as soon as that refreshes, um, I can only see those three accounts again. 
So depending on which user's view in this report, you get the data for that user. So you can safely share this same report out from the CEO down to your salespeople, everyone in between. Um, everyone can view the same report. You can all be talking about the same report, but each person will see only the data that their security roles um, gives them the access to see. Okay, so that's not the most complex Power BI report. Um, I'm not gonna build out a very complicated one. There's much more um, Power BI familiar people than I am out there, but this is the sort of tools that you're gonna to need to build out those, uh, those dashboards, which can really show what's going on in your business, but with all that um, safety built in. So there are a few gotchas. This is a preview feature. Um, so some are to be expected. Uh, it's good to know what they are. So. First of all, it only accesses those database entries. Um, I talked uh, near the start about how data storage now is split out across uh, the SQL database, blob storage and log storage. Um, so this is only accessing those entities that are still stored in the database. And that's still most of them, um, but because of that, you can't use this for a full on uh, data migration project. Um, you won't be able to access things like all your attachments, for example. Some entities are a little bit strange, so attachments is a good example. Um, the main part of the entity is still stored in the SQL database, um, so you can see all the records that are there, who created them, what records they're assigned to, but the actual contents of the attachment is stored elsewhere, so that column will always be null. There's no extensibility support, so any plugins that you might have, for example, on retrieve multiple plugins um, to do any extra security or anything like that, those won't be fired by running a SQL query. Um, I believe this is on the roadmap. Uh, Microsoft have been talking about it, that this will be here, um, but it's not here yet. So if you do rely on retrieve multiple to enforce some very bespoke security requirements you might have, unfortunately it probably means you can't enable this at the moment because those plugins aren't going to be fired. It does require a relatively up-to-date client because it requires the OAuth authentication method. If you're used to dealing with SQL Server authentication, Windows authentication, you might need to upgrade your client to one that supports the uh, Azure Active Directory authentication methods as well. So update version of SQL Server Management Studio. So the SQL client, if you're building your own .NET application, uh, does support it, although you might need to tweak the connection strings from what you're used to. Um, one thing I noticed was that the, the schema, so if you go into the uh, SQL Server Management Studio and keep drilling down in that object explorer, so from database down to the tables, we stopped in the demo at that point, but you can expand down from there to go and view the columns that are in those tables. If you compare those columns to what you get back if you do a select star from account, for example, you're gonna get a few more columns coming back in your results than what the schema says should be there. And that shouldn't normally be an issue. Um, but if you've got a, an application that's only expecting to get back what is in the schema, uh, there might be a few little issues there. Um, IntelliSense in SQL Server Management Studio doesn't work. Um, again, I think this is on the, the roadmap to get fixed, but at the moment, if you're typing in a query and you will see those little red squiggly underlines everywhere, don't be too afraid of that. It doesn't really mean anything about your query. Your query may very well be completely valid. You hit F5, it's going to run. Um, there's just some uh, bit of the, the wiring missing there that, that makes that uh, not pick up all that, uh, all that information that it's going to need. Um, Entity Framework is not supported apparently. Um, so you cannot build, for example, a, a database first model uh, in NC Framework. Um, you're gonna get all sorts of errors. And the tooling there is expecting it to be talking to a real SQL Server database with a lot of extra options in there that aren't supported by this endpoint. Um, apparently, I haven't tried this yet. Um, if you do a code first approach, you, it, it can actually build the right queries to execute um, once you've built that code, but the tooling is really expecting a, a full SQL server. And finally, there are some little oddities when you come to run queries themselves. So a, mostly you can run any select query that you want to run. Um, if you're doing some joins between some tables, you might well find that you've got to give aliases to all your tables. Um, select star from account as account, which just looks a little bit odd. Um, you shouldn't need to do it, but at the moment you do because of the way that the query is being rewritten at the moment before it gets all the way down to the SQL database. 
So there are some things that look like perfectly valid SQL, but you're going to get some little odd errors coming out of it. Um, I did a whole series on my blog, uh, markcarrington.dev, uh, when this first came out, uh, where I drill into some of these in a little bit more detail. So uh, if you are hitting some queries on that, please do go uh, check that out. So very quickly, um, what other things are out there that might be of use? Um, so there is the data export service. Now, I don't believe that this is really still being developed too much by Microsoft. Uh, I think it's largely been superseded by the next one, which is exports data lake. Both of these two uh, give you the option of basically synchronizing your CDS data out to some external source, and you can query it from there. So the data export service will uh, synchronize it out to an external SQL database, and you've got, again, the full power of SQL at your fingertips there. The problem with both of these, though, is that because the, the, they are external to Dynamics, they don't have all that uh, security again in place. Um, so it's really, a, again, an all or nothing sort of access unless you want to build your own security model on top of that again, which seems like an awful lot of work to me. Um, or finally, a, a quick plug for my own tool here, SQL for CDS, is uh, an XRM toolbox tool that's a little bit of best of both worlds. So you can write a SQL query and execute it directly against uh, CDS, so you're still getting that live data, you're still getting all the same security. Um, but it's also got support in there for inserts, updates, and deletes all via the, uh, the standard Dynamics uh, API. So you can use that if you want to do some ad hoc queries to go and query your data, go and find out, dig into your data a little bit, but also for doing some uh, bulk data updates as well. So finally, some contact details if you would want to follow up on anything with me. Um, so my blog is there, markcarrington.dev. Uh, you can get me on Twitter. And yes, uh, Data8, we are doing a, a lot of work with this as well for doing lots of data migration and analysis type work. So you can come and find us on there as well. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming to my session. Hope you found it all useful. Um, and thanks for DynamicsCon for uh, inviting me to share my content with you today.